remain standing and we're just going to kick it off with a verse of scripture from Psalms 119 verse 87. Psalms 119 verse 87. Christian, for almost a month, if not more, I've been seeing you sing. And I know that you direct choirs and you direct bands, but you're about to make a transition. The Lord has opened the door for you. Alrighty, yeah, I know. I don't think you've ever seen yourself singing, but I'm going to be there when you start singing and I will say, this is how the Lord showed it to me. Alrighty, so it's not just your hands. It's your voice also. Alrighty, so I'm looking forward to it. When, whenever you decide to just invite me, I'll come watch you. God is good. Praise the Lord. Psalms 119 verse 87. And I'm going to tell you something about this verse of scripture in just a moment, but I want us to read it first of all. It is also always amazing to stand and read the Word of God in an evening service like this. You see, this is Psalms 119 verse 87 and look at what it says. It says, they almost made an end of me on earth. But I know some of you, I know some of you can relate with that already. He says, they almost made an end of me on earth, but I did not forsake your precepts. Now, this is David saying, they nearly saw the end of me, but then I did not forsake your precepts. You see, this verse of scripture here makes the heart of God glad. And God is still on the search for people like David who will not forget the commandment of God, the precepts of God, regardless of what the world does to them or tries to do to them. He says right here on earth, they wanted to end my career. They wanted to end my ministry. They wanted to end my assignment. They did all of what they could, but I did not forget your precepts. Now, one more scripture, and then we're going to sit down and pray. This is Matthew chapter 17, verse 23. Matthew 17, 23. And look at what it says. In fact, I think we're going to have to read verse 22 so that we can have a good flow. The Bible says in Matthew 17, 22, Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. And what will they do? He says in 23, and they will kill him. And the third day, he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. Now, let me explain what's going on real quick before we sit down and pray. David, like I told you, was an, awesome, was an amazing prophet. The reason why many people did not notice or see him or take him for a prophet was because most of his prophecies were about one man and that man is the Lord Jesus Christ. Most of his prophecies were about the Messiah. And so when he was saying they nearly made an end of me on the earth, but I kept your precept, he was not just talking about his own experiences, but he was talking about the Lord Jesus. Now here is the Lord Jesus and people tried to make an end of him on the earth by killing him. But the disciples, as soon as they heard that Jesus was confirming to them that man will kill him, the Bible says they became sorrowful. But that was not all of what Jesus said. Jesus says, but I'm gonna rise again. And yet they were still sorrowful. Let's be seated. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to pray just one verse of scripture. And that is from Micah chapter 1 verse 7. It is one of our prayers for this season. And um, we've gone for too long without saying that prayer. I miss it. So we're going to say it now. The book of Micah is just before the book of Nahum or Nahum. And verse 7 of Micah chapter 1 is a prayer. It is a prayer that I believe every one of us should say often. And what does it say? It says, all her carved images shall be beaten to pieces, and all her pay as a harlot shall be burned with fire. All her idols I will lay desolate, for she gathered it from the pay of a harlot, and they shall return to the pay 
of a harlot. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come in here today open to receive your word. Father, in Jesus' name, whatever it is that we have treasured in our hearts above your word, whatever confidence that we have from having prostituted our attention, from having given our attention to idols, to things, to the system of this world, whatever confidence that we have had in that process, Lord, let it be removed from us. So that whatever it is that has taken your place in our heart, even the place of your word, we will be delivered of it. Such that at this particular point in time, the only confidence that we have is in you. The only hope that we have is in you. And all of the place that is in our heart is available for your word to be enthroned. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you something about Micah chapter 1 verse 7 is when you look at a harlot, someone that prostitutes themselves, they typically get a reward for it. Somebody pays them a wage. In some cases, it gives them access to things, to places. But that which they do is not right. You understand what I'm saying? But unknown to us, many of us haven't been raised in the system of the world, have been prostituting ourselves and we've been getting all of these little rewards, this little gain, even though the Lord told you not to move to that city, you moved to that city anyway because the pay for the job was good. And now the job and the environment was getting your attention. You are making friends with people that God has not written into your lives. You see, God is very serious about how he loves us. He told Jeremiah, he says, go and tell my people Judah that I divorced them and gave them a certificate. And then before Jeremiah could turn around, he says, but in reality, they are still mine. He said, the only reason why I said I divorced them and gave them a certificate was because of the fact that when Moses was teaching them about what it means to have commitment, they did not understand it. They said, no, we still want to divorce our wives. He says, Moses then said, okay, I'll give you a certificate. Something to remind you of your stubbornness, of your disobedience, of the hardness of your heart. And so God was like, a certificate of divorce is not a real thing. You still are one because what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. And so you know what that means? Is that even though you thought that you backslided, as far as God is concerned, you are still his. He said to Jeremiah, he says, tell my people that when they got out of the bed of their prostitution, they came to me. And you know what God says? He says, whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. But the reason why it is important for us to think about it thoroughly and recognize the implication of what we do when we take that which is God and that which is God's and give it to the world is that the heart of God is broken over us. Because many of us don't know because we don't see God. He's an invisible God. Many of us don't know simply because we are so determined out of greed and covetousness to get what the world is promising us. But the Lord is saying, you are mine and I am yours. I should get the best of you, the best of your time, the best of your passion, the best of your ability, the best of your emotional expression. All of that belongs to me because you are mine and I am yours. But God is still waiting for some of us to come back home. However, we want to return home with idols, with the pay of the harlot. Now God's heart is already broken that you weren't there in the first place. And now that you're returning and you're bringing the idols, you know what that looks like? It looks like you're just rubbing it in his face. Look at what I got while I was in someone else's bed while you were waiting for me. And that is the reason why this prayer is very critical because Jesus, the bridegroom, is coming back. And when he comes back, he doesn't want to see those things that will continue to remind him of how broken his heart has been over us. So this is what the Lord Jesus will do because he's coming to begin a new chapter. He's only inviting and receiving the ones 
who would have given away all of what they got in the days of ignorance, in the days of disobedience, the things that they have gone, that they have received, the rewards and the promises that they have been made in the days of their prostitution. You need to let go of all of it because if you are trying to bring it, Jesus is not there to receive you. So that is why it is critical for us to say this prayer. Can I tell you one of the things that many of us are not even aware of that we've all engaged in it is prostitution with mammon, the God of money. Do you know how many times you have run to mammon when God's arms were open to receive you? Do you know? And that is why the Lord told us about a year and a half ago. He said, tell my people to divorce themselves from mammon. Because that relationship is an unholy relationship. You belong to me. What are you doing running to mammon? The Bible says that the, prost, the, 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 um, the whore of Babylon, that's the way it's, she's called in prophecy. By her deceitfulness, she's been able to get all of the kings of the earth polluted. Let me tell you something. By the wine of her drunkenness. And you know what the wine of drunkenness is? It is the pleasure that mammon gives. Do you know that recently, you may not know, but I'll tell you recently, I was talking to a man of God who is very close to me, someone in my family. And he said to me, he said, I have recognized that when I'm not feeling good and somebody sends me money, I suddenly start feeling good. How many people have ever experienced that? You went to church and you still went home sad. You read your Bible and you prayed, but you couldn't break the sorrow. And then as soon as somebody sends you money or you figure out that your refund, your whatever that thing is called, your tax refund shows up in the mail, you're suddenly cheerful. Let me tell you something. When we, when we experience that, truly and genuinely, we should be ashamed of ourselves. Simply because what we're saying is that the love of money our hearts are more sensitive to it than our hearts are sensitive to the love of God. One of the things I told my brother recently, very recently I told my brother, I said one of the things that I aspire to is this, that I will be joyful and peaceful and delighted all the days of my life regardless of what I have or what I don't. I told him, I said, I want to get to that place and stay in that place. Now let me say this, many of us, we know how to get to that place, but staying in that place is the challenge. I want to get there and stay there and be there wherein my faith is more precious to me than anything else that is material in this world. Many years ago, one of my friends said this to me. Wow, he said, Brother Moses. He says, congratulations. And I'm like, how did you know? He said, I don't know. He said, but I know. He said, I heard something in your voice that lets me know that one of your clients or somebody just paid you money. I said, no, literally, I am just in the parking lot. I just got the check. He said, I could tell. I said, how could you? He said, I know from your voice when you have money and when you don't. <laughs> oh yeah, my friend Ralph, one of these days I hope you meet him. He can read me like a book. He said to me, he could, maybe not now, I don't know, but back, back then he could. I said, you must be joking. I said, what gave it away? He says, no, you gave it away. He said, when I call you and you don't have money, he said, I can tell. He said, but the moment you have some money or you've had some breakthrough in whatever business you're doing, he said, there is this stint of, of pitch. There's this pitch in your voice. A stint of excitement. I was like, I don't believe you. He says, okay, when I called you about three weeks ago, he mentioned the time in the past when he called me. He said, you were trying to be cheerful. You were trying to encourage yourself with scriptures and revelations. He said, but I knew that you were broke. <laughs> and he was right on the money. I was as broke as chalk on the day. He said, I can tell. 
And so I was referring to that incident when I was talking to my brother a couple of days ago. I said, I want to get to a place wherein I always have that pitch in my voice just because I have faith. I want faith and confidence in God to be as real to me all the days of my life as it needs to be. You, you, we all know this stuff. Let me tell you something. If somebody comes out and says, today I'm going to pray for you to have faith. Many of us will open one eye while he's praying and say, yeah, come on, just give us this faith. But the moment that I say that and that I can see that someone is going to give you $2,500 by tomorrow, then you're like, amen. You see, because. Oh, you look at that. You see, while I yet spoke, she confirmed it as a witness. Let me tell you something, folks. Money has a hold on your emotions. On our emotions. Let's all get real here that faith should have. You know, faith can, can have a hold on your emotions. The moment your heart receives the faith or the level of faith that is required for you to progress in that season of life that you're in, it begins to do something to your emotions. Remember the man who came to Jesus. Before he left home, he had some measure of confidence. His son had been troubled or his son was being troubled by a demonic spirit and he recognized that if they would go to Jesus, that there would be healing. So he got to where Jesus was. And before he could encounter Jesus, the disciples, they stopped him along the way. Because remember that they had just come back from a mission trip. The disciples had just come back from a mission trip wherein they were casting out demons and they were healing the sick. And so they were so happy and, and delighted that wow, Jesus does not even have to take our word for it. Here is a case where we can demonstrate to Jesus that we got the power. So Jesus was afar off and they accosted the man and they tried to cast out the demon and it wasn't working. The only thing that was coming out was sweat from their faces. They were there working all of what they did and they were conversing amongst themselves. Just yesterday we were casting out demons and all of that good stuff. And the man was like, are you guys sure that you are Jesus' disciples? And the Bible says that they started to argue with the man. You know how it is when we're failing in our responsibilities, we resort to self-defense. And because they were supposed to do what was needful, heal the sick and you refused. And guess what? Instead of you admitting that your strength was What's, was what, uh, what's the word? The Bible says if your strength fails in the day of adversity, that means it is little. Instead of them to admit that their power was already gone or was not enough, they were trying to defend their fruitlessness and their powerlessness. Which is what we've done a lot in the church. You know how we do. We decide to argue with people when we're supposed to show the demonstration of power. But the story that I'm... The, the, the lesson that I want to bring out of that story is that this man, he left home believing in his heart that Jesus has the power to heal that boy. When he got to where the disciples were, he still believed. That was why he would even let them pray for the child in the first place. If he didn't believe, he would have said to them, I didn't come for you, you're students, you're still learning. I came for your master. But by the time this man got to Jesus, what did he say? He said to Jesus, I believe. And he started to cry. And then he says, Lord, help my unbelief. Let me tell you something. All of the, the, all of the arguments that they were having about theology did not bring out any emotions out of the man. The Bible says that they were having a debate, but the Bible didn't say that the man was angry. There was no emotion until the man said that I believe. And as soon as he started to cry, Jesus says, your faith. Jesus confirmed his faith because Jesus saw that his belief was now controlling his emotions. Many of us will say that we believe that God is the provider and yet our emotions are still that of sorrow rather than that of joy. Until you have, until you have faith that is substantial enough to begin to reflect in your emotion, 
you are still building steam. You're not there yet. If I say that I believe that God is the provider and I don't have any money in my bank account, should I be sorrowful or should I be joyful? I should be joyful because I believe. So if I'm still sorrowful, then that means I do not believe. I believe that we have come to a season, folks, wherein the Lord himself is bringing out from his word the yardstick for measuring faith so that every single one of us is able to do a self-assessment in the season that we're in of where we are in our relationship with God. And I say that because of the fact that when the Lord said to his disciples, come and watch with me a little, it wasn't because he needed their prayers as much as he knew that they needed to know exactly where they were at. Because if they knew where they were at, nobody would beg them to pray. If they knew where they were at, they would have gone for faith rather than continue to strategize on how they will evade persecution. But I tell you one thing for a fact, ladies and gentlemen, that the emotions of our lives, the moment they are being controlled by faith in our hearts, then guess what's gonna happen? We will remain steadfast and immovable. Let me give you another example. You know, I've talked about money. I've talked about how money can just change your mood suddenly. Do you know one of those other things that we have allowed to control our emotions? is the words of other people. We are more confident in the words of other people than we are in what God has said. Many of us want to go to the hospital and hear the doctor say that you will be okay. They look at you, they touch your ear, they measure your temperature, they offer you a piece of note that will qualify you to get some medication from a store down the road and that's it your condition hasn't changed in any way but you go home more confident that you will be okay because of the word of a man imagine if the word of God is that powerful in your life imagine if you will always know that this word of God is as powerful as it sounds. If God says that I am the Lord that heals you, imagine if you truly believe that, then you will not sit there questioning your existence. You will not be there sorrowing over your own life because now you believe the word of God. Let us go back to Matthew 17, 23 and then we'll see why these people were sorrowful. Matthew 17, 23, because Jesus says that they would kill him and that on the third day he will be raised up. The Bible says they were exceedingly sorrowful. The disciples were sorrowful simply because of this very thing that I just explained to you. They were living a life wherein the emotions of their lives had become only responsive to bad news. Jesus gave them what you would call bad news, but then he also gave them good news. Even that which they thought was bad news itself was good news because they were the same people that Jesus had drilled previously on who they recognized him to be. They knew that Jesus was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And because all 12 of them were Jews, one thing that they knew also was that a lamb or any animal for that matter is unable to take your sins in atonement until he was killed. So when Jesus said he was going to be killed, what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to be dancing and rejoicing, saying finally, our sins are going to be blotted out because the Lamb of God. Imagine if this Lamb is the one that will take away your sins, but he keeps walking around. As long as he's walking around, your sins are not going anywhere. How would you feel if you were an Old Testament human being who went to the temple with an animal that you had prayed over? Remember what they did was they put their hands on the animal 
and confess their sins, which is they transfer their sins to the animal and then they send off the animal to be slaughtered by the priest. And then you get there and the priest is like, oh, I like this animal. I'm going to just keep it. <laughs> oh yeah, and then you see the animal walking around the next day with a big chain around its neck and a tag. You would not be happy because that is your sin still walking around. It hasn't gone anywhere. So these people were raised in a culture that ensured that you saw the high priest or the, or the priest slaughter your animal. You had to ensure, you had to stay there and oversee the process to make sure that, oh, okay, <laughs> now my sins are gone. The moment the blood is flowing, then the people turned their backs and went home. It didn't matter to them whatever the high priest or whatever the Levites did with the meat. You can eat the meat. I don't care. But the blood that's flowing is the testament or the, or the testimony that my sins are forgiven. But these people, because of, the, because of worldliness, because of immaturity and sensitivity, because of prostitution, they had prostituted their hearts to the system of this world. And the system of the world had taught them one thing, that once your king was dead, you were doomed. You are helpless. But now, Jesus is trying to reorientate these people to let them recognize that it is a good thing for me to go. He said to them, if I don't go, the spirit of truth will not come. I am the Lamb of God. I need to be slain. When Jesus was delivering this to them, even Jesus was wondering what happened. Did you not hear what I said? Now let's even assume that the disciples were not Jews. That they did not understand the principle of, of having an animal slaughtered for there to be remission of sins. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Let's even assume that they did not know that, that they never heard that from Moses, that they never were taught that in the synagogue. The fact that Jesus said he was going to be raised on the third day, shouldn't that give them some delight? But no, they were not delighted. Why? Because their hearts were not living with God, their hearts were living with the world. You see, whoever you're close to is the one you hear more clearly. If I am sitting next to Anne and I'm whispering to her, she will hear me more than if Ryan was standing at the Chevron gas station down the road yelling on top of his voice because that distance takes his voice. Many of us, the word of God and the voice of God is not hitting our hearts because we are so far from him. So Jesus told them that he was going to be slaughtered and he told them that he was going to be raised from the dead. But the only one they heard was that he was going to be slaughtered because their emotions betrayed their confidence. Their emotions revealed what they truly believe. Their emotions reveal where they are. The Bible says they were exceedingly sorrowful. Folks, I'm, let me just quickly tell you. The secret was the first thing that we read today. Psalms 119 verse 87. David said that they nearly ended me on the earth. He says, but I continued to follow your precepts. The secret to not allowing the world and unbelief to continue to control the emotions and the forces that govern your life is to stay very close to the word of God. Is to follow the precepts of the word of God. Not just be aware of it, but follow it. <laughs> Let me tell you something. These people were following Jesus, but they were not following the word of God. Let me explain that. Because many people in today's world are like the disciples. They follow Jesus. Wherever he goes, they go. Whatever meeting Jesus is, up or is running, they attend. They are around the things of the move of God, but they were not themselves moved by God. Even though they were following Jesus, they did not follow him as the word of God. Can I prove that to you? Do you know that every one of these 12 disciples were around Jesus the day the woman with the issue of blood received her healing? 
And not only was she healed, she was made whole. To be made whole means to be a complete human being, lacking nothing. So not, did, not only did the woman receive her healing, she received the restoration of her soul. Whereas the disciples were there and they were still broken men. There were still men who lacked the confidence for living. There were still men who lacked the understanding for operating. Even though they were around Jesus, rubbing shoulders with him. But the woman recognized that this Jesus was the word of God. Because what they were told for thousands of years was that one day the Lord will send his word and his word will heal them. And what did the woman say? The woman say, if I may but touch the hem of his garment. She recognized that if this is the word of God, all I need to do is make contact. And this word will heal me freely. To heal somebody freely means to heal them and to set them free. Because back in the day, physicians will attend to you and heal you, but you were not free. Simply because until you pay off all the debt, associated with the ointment and the bandage, you were not free. So they can help to restore your broken arm, but you had to work it off. And some people had to work it off almost a year for them to be free. So that is the reason why when God promised them, he says, my word will heal you freely. Because once it heals you, it makes you a free man. And that was what happened to this woman. She recognized that Jesus was the word of God. So she wasn't just following Jesus. She was following the word of God. Many of us follow religious activities. We follow other people who seem to be following Jesus. But we are not following the word of God. What does it mean to follow the word of God? To allow your thoughts to go in the direction that the word of God is leading. When you hear in the news that the economy is about to take a big fall, is your heart following that bad news unto sorrow? Is your heart following that bad news unto loss of hope? Is your heart following that bad news unto self-medication and self-help? Or is your heart following what the Word of God says that the Lord, His name is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides for you? Our hearts need to learn how to follow the precepts of God. Otherwise, we will always be at the crossroads of life and death. What the world is saying is death. What the Lord has said is life. And the Lord continues to say, I said before you this day, life and death. Choose life that you may live. He said to them, I'll be crucified. But then he also said to them, I'll be resurrected. Why were they getting sorrowful that he'll be resurrected? When they had equal chances of being joyful that he would be resurrected. Let me say that again. Why were they sorrowful that he would be crucified? When they had equal chances of being joyful that he'll be resurrected. Do you know that every time that you're sorrowful, it is your choice? Because you can always choose to be joyful. Paul says, rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. The Bible says, in all things, give thanks. Sing in hymns unto the Lord. In all things. Do you know that every time that you're feeling pain in your body, and you become sorrowful, you choose to be sorrowful because when pain is in your body, it's telling you one thing in addition to with the one that you have received. The one most of us receive emotionally is that, oh, I'm hurting. I cannot do what I want to do. My body is in pain. But at the same time, that pain is telling you now you have an opportunity to experience the Jehovah Rapha. Every time you lose a thing in this world, it is an opportunity for you to receive double because the promise of God over your life is that he will give you double for your trouble. He told Jeremiah, he said, tell my people, I will give them double for all their trouble. Look at when Job, everything Job lost, he got back double. He had 10 children. By the time the chapter ended, he had 20. Everything that he had, he received what? He received double. And so every single time that you are exceedingly sorrowful, it is your complete choice. Let me tell you something. The world system wants to make an end of you. It wants to kill you. It wants to crucify you. But the Lord wants to raise you up every single time. So why are you sorrowful? I want you to declare this season your turnaround season. Wherein you're turning every situation around for the better. Every situation that comes to expose your shame will be turned around to reveal his glory. 
Every situation that has come to exploit your pain threshold will become a situation that reveals its comfort level. Because every pain that you experience qualifies you for every comfort that he is willing to give. Jesus says I'll be killed, but he also says that I'll be resurrected. Now choose this day whom you will follow. Will you follow the bad news to the grave or will you follow the good news to the Mount of Ascension? I said to you a couple of weeks ago that we have come to a glorious season, another season of fours. How many people remember that I said that a couple of weeks ago? That we have come to another season of force. The very first time that the Lord announced over, over us at communion house that we were coming to a season of force was somewhere between 2020 and 2021. And when the Lord said that to us, what did he say? He broke it down. He says, four things are happening in this season. Jesus says, my, my persecution, my crucifixion, my resurrection, and my ascension. And we saw all of those things manifest between 2020 and 2021. God gave us the signs of things to look for. And now we have come to another season of fours. Wherein there will be persecution. There will be crucifixion. There will be resurrection. And there will be ascension. But the devil wants you to focus only on the persecution. And he wants you to be afraid of the crucifixion. The devil wants you to focus on the things that have come to end your life. The things that have come to end your aspirations. The things that have come to tell you that that career that you think you're going to have is not going to happen. If it's going to happen, it should have happened a long time ago. Now you're even 27 years old. What's the hope? But that is where the devil wants you to stop. So that you can end up being exceedingly sorrowful. The devil keeps telling you things like that child is a lost cause. Just forget about that child. Live your life. No, but you don't forget about what God has given to you. When the word of God says, as for me and the children that the Lord has given to me, we are for signs and we are for wonders. This is an opportunity for there to be a wonder in the earth when this child suddenly turns around and begins to share testimony of great deliverance. It is your turnaround season and the key is in your hand to choose whether you will be sorrowful or whether you will be joyful. Knowing what you know now, Manuelita, that James and John did not know, when Jesus says to you what he said to them, will you be sorrowful or will you rejoice? Because you know that when God promises resurrection, he will never fail. Jesus promised us one thing. He says, in the world, you have tribulations and trials. He says, they will persecute you the way they persecuted me. He says, the way that I have been is the way that you will be. And he was crucified. You also will be crucified. I'm telling you, you may not hang on a cross like he did physically, but there will be challenges in this world. Not just to you as an individual, but to the body of Christ as a whole that will seem to have come to spell the end of us. Let me do something for you all tonight. Come with me to the book of Romans chapter 12, verse 17. And then I'm going to make an announcement and then we're going to break bread. Romans 12, 17, it says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. I want you to focus on this one thing. It says what? Have regard for good things. You see, because there is always good and evil. But that which you regard is that which you follow. And that which you follow, guess what? is the one that will be with you in the day of affliction. You remember about three months ago, the Lord says that the ones that are with you now are the ones that will be with you in the day of affliction. If you choose to defend people's foolishness today, it is foolish people that you'll be stuck with in the day of affliction. Because they are the ones you're following. But if your heart chooses to follow righteousness, to follow that which is good. When darkness comes and covers the earth, you will not be in darkness because you are in close proximity to the light. I want to encourage you folks 
if you continue to allow, let me, let me tell you something the Lord said to me a while ago. On this issue of trusting in anything else outside of God. God asked me, he says, is there any other God that can answer when you call? The Bible says all other gods are the works of men. They are the result of the carving of wood by the hands of men. They have eyes, but they cannot see. Ears, but they cannot hear. Mouths, but they cannot speak. So why do you want to continue to associate your confidence with gods that do not answer when you call? It's a no-brainer. Money cannot answer when you call. Someone says, oh, Brother Moses, but the Bible says that money answers all things. But the Bible also says in the book of Isaiah 45 that they have put their trust in images carved into wood, which is another expression for money that cannot save in the day of affliction. You can whip out money in the day of pleasure, buy yourself a nice fancy car. You can whip out money in the day of, of pleasure and buy yourself a drink and drink yourself to stupor. But when death comes knocking on the door, how much money can you offer it? When infirmity comes, you can pay for doctors, but you cannot pay for healing. And that's what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying you need to start practicing now in the face of all of these little challenges, how to call my name so that in that day, you will know exactly where I'm at and how to get my attention. The disciples were exceedingly sorrowful. They were not just sorrowful. They were exceedingly sorrowful. You know why? Because they thought that was the end. But David says, no, I followed the precepts of God. I did not die. He says, look at me, I'm alive. A living witness of the faithfulness of God. And that is exactly what your testimony needs to be. But in order for that to be your testimony, you need to retrain the emotions of your heart to not be glad or more excited about money than they are about faith. I told my wife about a couple of years ago, maybe four or five years now, I said to my wife, I said, I have discovered one thing, that the moment I see what I have heard, it doesn't matter what I am seeing or what I am hearing, my heart is confident in God. Now let me explain to you what that means. You see, when I see in a vision with the eyes of faith what God has said in his word it doesn't matter what I'm seeing around me or what I am hearing I am no longer afraid I begin to rejoice I begin to live confident as though it has already happened simply because that's what faith is calling the things that are not as though they are so that they can be but your emotions have to be in they have to be responsive to the word of God. Let's do a little exercise. We're going to do two exercises. The first one that I will tell you about is the second one that we will do. And it's this one. I want you to think about the things that have weighed on your heart the most in recent times. And think about how it makes you feel. You may be thinking about your business and how slow things have been and how it makes you feel. Does it make you feel godless? Does it make you feel abandoned? Does, you, does it make you feel frustrated? If that is what it makes you feel, then you need another kind of feeling. Before we leave here today, I want you to also think about that same business. And then think about what the Word of God has said concerning that business. Let me give you an example for those who are in business. The Bible says that God blesses the works of your hands and increases your seed sown. The Bible says that whatsoever you lay your hands upon will prosper. If that is what the Word of God says, then when you think about that business, your emotions should not be negative, but they should be positive. They should be that of joy. They should be that of hope. They should be that of glorious aspirations as opposed to you anticipating bankruptcy. Do you know that when your emotions become that of frustration in the face of any situation, you begin to strategize your own execution. 
instead of you to receive inspiration by the promises of the word of God to strengthen yourself and do what David did, which is David encouraged himself in the world. You start to plan your exit strategy. You start to plan the stories that you would tell to the people that you owe money to. You start to plan how you're going to leave town so that you can save face. You start to plan how you're going to go look for another way to get out of the trouble that you are in. You, my friend, no matter how creative you are, you are not the way maker. And you're definitely not the savior. And you should rejoice because you're not the savior because you can't save yourself. But that's what happens. The moment you begin to follow your emotions, rather than following the precepts of God, rather than following the promises of God, rather than following the divine assurances of the principles of God's kingdom, guess what? You start to plan a way to get out of it. Judas, he heard that Jesus was going to be killed. But he didn't hear that he was going to be resurrected, even though Jesus said it. So he thought to himself, I have been this man's treasurer. He was Jesus' treasurer. He was in charge of money. And before Jesus came, there was no money. When Jesus came, people started giving money to Jesus' ministry. And Judas had a career. But when he heard that Jesus was going to be crucified, guess what happened? He started to stage for himself how he was going to execute that career and find a way out for himself. His exit strategy was to sell Jesus off. If you are going to die, then let me make some money from your death. And many of us are like that. We recognize what has been said, but we hold on to that which our emotions are responding to. And so his emotions of exceeding sorrow was what? Leading him in the direction of being creative and to have for himself an exit strategy. That self-help does not help. Let me say this again. That self-help does not help. I tell you what, a friend of mine, he has a multi-million dollar business today here in the state of Georgia. And a couple of years ago, his house was only a few days away from being auctioned off. Five children and like 20 cats. Where were they going to go? You know what happened? He said he became very sorrowful. He said, I didn't cry, Brother Moses. He said, I wailed. He said, my wife came into the room and she couldn't tell where the snot was coming out of because my entire face was covered. He said, we had given up. And the woman started packing. He said, but it occurred to him that he didn't know where they were going. And that was when the Holy Spirit got his attention. He was like, well, we can pack because the house is about to be auctioned off. He said, but we have nowhere to go. So he said, Lord, I have come to you. What will you have me do? And the Lord says, if I want you to do anything, I would have told you. That was when he realized that he was being led by his emotions. God did not tell him to leave that house. You see, many of us, we are following our emotions. Judas followed his emotions. He died. Peter followed his emotions. He found shame, a bucket load of shame. The rest, their behavior was so bad, it was not even worth writing. But guess what? If we would allow our faith to control our emotions. Our emotions will take instructions that lead to life rather than death. You see, this issue of being married to the things of the world is what is killing most believers. We want to continue to live with the world but enjoy the comfort of the Lord. Someone said this a while ago. He says you cannot put your head in the bosom of Delilah and expect the comfort of the Messiah. You cannot. You have to choose this day whom you shall serve. So he realized at that particular moment, he said, Brother Moses, I realized that I was following my own frustration. Because it was frustration that made them to start removing their pictures from the wall. Why? Because they heard that they were about to lose the house. And that was what he did. He said, I decided to wait until the Lord said more. He said, but at that time, he didn't tell me to move. So I told my wife, we're not packing. And the woman was like, oh, we have to. We have just a few days. We're not going to start packing after the house has been auctioned off. And he said to the woman, he says, please, 
let us follow what the Lord has said. And right now, he just says to wait. Two days after that conversation with the Holy Spirit, their debt was completely written off and the house was theirs. This is not a fairy tale. This is somebody that many of you have met. He's come to a number of our functions. This is a real life person who lives in the same state as you. This is not someone from the Old Testament. Before you start thinking that, well, maybe those guys had six fingers instead of five. No, I've seen his fingers. They're only five, just like yours. And I've seen him cry. He's a man, not a God. So what is your excuse? I want to encourage you today to do one thing and one thing only. I'm going to show you one verse of scripture and then we're going to close this thing out. We're going to do another 17. So come with me to Psalm 17. And this is a prayer. Another prayer. You see, it's very easy to pray for an hour. How do I pray? How does my wife pray? We pray the word of God. There's more than enough. Have you prayed all the scriptures that are in the word of God? No, you haven't. So why are you running out of things to say when you pray? It is good to pray in tongues. Like Paul said, he said, I pray in tongues. I pray in tongues more than all of y'all. That was what he said. But I am telling you also that it is not just for you to pray in tongues. Praying in tongues is one kind of prayer or it encompasses a number of prayers. But the Bible says pray with all manners of prayers, not just with some kinds of prayers. And one of the ways by which you can engage in all manners of prayers is to learn how to pray scriptures. This week, by the grace of God, and this is the special announcement, I want to encourage you, just like my wife said, to pray for an hour. I already announced that to the leaders on Thursday, that Jesus is asking us to wait and watch with him an hour. You may be thinking to yourself, Brother Moses, do you know what an hour is? Yeah, it's less than a football game. If I remember correctly, a football game is what? 90 minutes? Four quarters? Can somebody help us out here? Football games? How long does it take for a football game? Four hours? Let me ask you a question. Is there anyone in here that has ever watched an entire football game from beginning to the end? You have? So you sat there for all that four hours. Wonderful. So maybe rather than declare an hour prayer, we should just declare four. Because it looks like we're used to. We're used to it already, just not in the right temple. You know that when you're watching football, you, you're praying. Do you know that that's what you're doing? Because your, your, your emotions, your faith and everything is praying that they win. Imagine if you would bring all of that emotions to, to your closet. And start to look at all of the players that are in your life. The things that are supposed to be advancing on the enemy. And start to pray for them to gain ground upon the enemy. Every time you remember something God has drawn, done for you, you draw a line and you measure it. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says count your blessings. Name them one by one. And then you would realize how much ground you are gaining over the enemy. So rather than being sorrowful, you'll be joyful because you are never losing. You're always winning. But Satan doesn't want you to know how much you have covered in the, in the ground. That's why he keeps telling you to look at shadows. But this week that we're getting into communion house, we will pray for an hour every day. On some days, you may even find me on Facebook or Instagram, one of those life things leading the charge just to encourage you. But if I don't show up, you show up. Pray for an hour. Get yourself scriptures. You understand what I mean? You could even spend 30 minutes looking for scriptures and writing them down and then spend another 30 minutes praying those scriptures into reality. Amen. Let me tell you something. One of the ways by which I pray is so simple. I look at a thing that I don't like and I find it in scripture. Back in the day when I was still actively consulting, if I was faced with a problem because my clients call me and say, well, we don't know how to resolve this issue. We believe that there is data here, but we can't interpret the data. To them, it is darkness. When they present it to me, it is darkness. You know what I would do? I would take that solution and find it in scripture. And the moment I find darkness in scripture, 
and look for what God did about it. The Bible says when darkness was upon the face of the deep, God says, let there be light and there was light. So I would take Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 and start to quote it over the equation. Whatever it is, let there be light and there was light. Let there be light and I will keep saying that as I am praying until there is light. So I want to encourage you, you, even you can pray for two hours without even knowing it. Prayer should not be a boring thing. Can you imagine anyone that is more interesting to talk to than God? This God has seen everything before. I know every one of us, we have gist partners here. People that we talk to about sports, about politics, about what not. But no matter how much they know about that subject, they don't know as much as God. So imagine if, you can, if God can get your attention. Because you can always get his attention. The Bible says whoever must come to God must first of all believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He says, seek me and you will find me. It is not your, God's attention that you're not getting. It is your attention that God is not getting. Many of us need to pray this week from Micah chapter 1 verse 7. I say, Lord, all of those things that I got from prostituting myself to the world, I want to be divorced of those things so that I can be fully attentive to you. The reason why many of us cannot pay attention to God is because of the fact that our hearts are still living with the world. So this week we're going to pray. I told us that we're going to do two things before we break the bread. The first thing, that I told you of is what? Examine your heart. Just take one thing that has become a burden in your life. Examine how you feel about it. And by the time we're done praying, I want you to ask yourself again, how do I feel about it now? That is the second thing that we're going to do. But the first thing that we're going to do is that the Lord revealed to me that there are so many people here. I wish Michelle was here because Michelle was one of the people that God showed to me. And Brother Franklin's son that I haven't even met is another one of those people that was shown to me. But I want you all to pay attention to this. The Lord says there are so many people here who are trying to make a decision. You're trying to choose between two things and you were hoping and you've been hoping that the man of God will call you out and prophesy and say, this is what you must do. I tell you today, when I was coming for this service, the Lord gave me two things. He gave me the Yorim and the Thummim. If you don't know what the Yorim and the Thummim are, let me tell you this. Back in the day, whenever the high priest was seeking the Lord concerning the nation of Israel, he had 12 stones on his ephod, on his breastplate, representing each one of those tribes. And behind that breastplate, behind that ephod, was another pouch. And in that pouch were two stones called the Yarim and the Thummim. So whenever he said, Lord, this is the tribe of Judah, they want to go to war with their enemies. Should they go or should they not go? He would dip into his ephod. And whether it was the Yorim or the Thummim, which translates into lights and perfection, he would be able to tell them what to do. And that is the reason why people would go seeking the high priest, go after the prophets or the seer so that they may know what God is saying. And the Lord is saying that the Yorim and the Thummim is here. You don't need another to tell you. Even you can dip your hand into the pouch yourself and know exactly what the Lord is saying. Someone is saying, Lord, do I go or do I stay? Today in here today, you will hear the voice of the Lord for yourself telling you which way you must go. Let us rise up to our feet. No, no, let's sit down. The Lord says break bread sitting down because we, we have to do it in that order. We break bread sitting down. The moment we get up, we're getting up to doing exercises that will change our situations and ultimately change our lives. Praise the Lord. Alrighty, so Father, in Jesus' name, uh, let me, we're gonna, we have a scripture for breaking bread today. It's in Psalms 101. <laughs> For some of you, this will become one of your favorite scriptures in this season. Look at what it says, Psalm 101 verse 4. It says, a perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. How many more minutes do I have? Let's do this very quickly. When we started, what did we start with? Micah chapter 1 verse 7. The Lord is calling out our old ways.
to reveal that which has been occupying the place of God in our lives. Many of us, we have been content with what the world has given to us. Let me explain that. The Holy Spirit would have me explain this for the sake of some people in here, in fact, one person in particular. You have become accustomed to the pay of a harlot. And what I mean by that is every time your heart is not showing faithfulness to God, but paying attention to another, you have received some kind of reward. And I'll give you an example of the rewards that we've received. Many of, I've heard people say this, that, oh, I've come to understand myself and I know my weakness. And that is what motivates me. Many of us are motivated by our weaknesses and by our failures rather than by the inspiration of God. And so one of the things that you have learned because of how people have dealt with you treacherously in business, whenever you're doing business, rather than loving people, you are judging them and you become very good at it. Because that is the reward that you got for not trusting in God, for trusting in your own abilities. And every time God wants to promote you, you limit yourself because God wants you to be loving, not judging. You see, when you understand what it means to ask the Lord to remove from you the pay that you have received as a harlot, one of the things that it means is you want to stop being confident in the skills that you have acquired while you are being deceitful. The skills that you have acquired while you have been worldly. Some of us have become very skilled in the things of the world. You become very skilled at borrowing money rather than receiving providence from God. You have become very skilled at eliminating people so that you can be lightweight in your business operation. Whereas God is saying, I want you to be like the oak tree that others can come and find shelter under. Not the, right, not the wrong people, the right people. So all of the pay and the reward that you have had from running after the things of the world, the Lord is saying, I want you to get rid of those because you cannot trust in those things and trust in me at the same time. Recently, I learned about a guy who's become so skilled at gambling. And you can't tell him otherwise. This, this is a real human being that I went to over 10 years ago to learn certain fundamental principles of business. He was gifted by God, called by God. But guess what? He found how good he was at gambling. And he has the reward of gambling. One day he called me. He said, I'm going to send you a picture. Whatever you see in that picture is all mine. He sent me the picture of a yacht, a massive one by gambling. Many of us, by prostituting ourselves in the way of the world, we have had some success, quote unquote. And that is what our confidence is in. The Lord is saying you need to separate yourself from the pay that you received. Not the beatings that you, because some people got beatings while they were prostituting themselves, but some people got a reward and now they have magnified that and convinced themselves that that is the way to go. So I am telling you that the Lord wants you to separate yourself from every one of those unholy gains that you have received. Like I told you, it's for one person in particular and he already knows what to do with what I have said. But for the rest of us, the Lord has given us this scripture to break bread with. Psalms 101 verse 4. Look at what it says one more time. It says, a perverse heart shall depart from me, I will know no wickedness. I will not know wickedness. So as we break bread today, I want you to say, Lord, every perversion, every perverse way, every worldly scheme, every worldly way that has become a part of my operation, that my heart is always responding to, that my emotions are always gravitating toward, Lord, remove that from me. From here onwards, I am no longer responding to wickedness. From here onwards, I am no longer led by the deceitfulness of sin. From here onwards, I am no longer paying attention to bad news. From here onwards, I follow your precepts. 
Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because you have given your word and your word heals us and sets us free. You see, this word of God, if you would meditate on it, if you would pray it and believe what it says, it will set your heart free from responding to bad news. You see, imagine if the disciples had prayed this prayer. When Jesus says he was going to be killed, they will not be sorrowful because their heart will not even take note of the death part of the story. Their heart will be longing to see the glory of God revealed. So as we break bread today, I want you to say this is the testimony and the promise of God over your life and it will become your reality. So while we're sitting there, I want you to take the bread representing the body of Jesus and the wine. And I was just told that um, we need to read verse 7 as well. The Bible says here that he who works the seat shall not dwell within my house. He who tells lies shall not continue in my presence. This is the antidote to one of those problems that I described at the beginning. That many of us we know how to rejoice when we have faith. But the problem is how to stay and sustain that joy even though the situation has not changed. We know how to quickly get there, but how do we stay there? How do we make that our abode? The Bible says the secret to staying in the place of faith, the secret to staying in the place of power, the secret to abiding in the glory of God is to not tell a lie. What is a lie? A lie is that which is not the truth. What is the truth? The truth is the word of God. And so whatever it is that the world is saying about you, that your situation is saying about you, some of us, the situations that we're in, have called us names. Let us address this very critically, very quickly. Many of you, or many of us, the situations that we're in, have called us names like losers. Situations will come and call you names like lazy. Situations will come and call you names like unfortunate. Some situations will come and call you unlucky. Now how come it's always you? When Roland, Roland did that business, he made money. When Andrew, who did not even go to school, came and did that business, he made money. Even Pius, that you introduced to the business, he made money. But as soon as you show up, everything dries up. You are unfortunate. Many of us situations have called us names that God did not call us. Many of us, because of the fact that the result of what we are doing, even we are not confident in it, we accept that we must be lazy or we must just be unfortunate. Whereas God is not asking you to break your neck to break through. The Bible says, here a little, very little. And from heaven comes the increase. But what the Bible says here is that those lies, as long as it comes out of your mouth, it keeps you away from being in the place of faith. So stop agreeing with familiar spirits with situations and circumstances, stop agreeing with people, stop agreeing with the results that you have not yet seen to tell lies about your existence. The Bible says that you're a royal priesthood, royal priesthood, holy nation. The Bible says that you are a prosperous man because whatsoever you lay your hands upon prospers. The Bible says you are the head and not the tail. The Bible says that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that God made you so that he can show forth his praise. You are an example of what it means to be a child of God. And that is the truth about you. So the only way you're going to maintain your faith stamina is by speaking the truth and not a lie. 
The Lord says, verse 4 is what you do. Verse 7 is what I do. The Lord is saying, you speak concerning the deliverance of your heart. And I have spoken my truth over you. So as your heart has been delivered of perverseness or perversions and of wickedness, now your mouth will begin to speak the truth of God's word. And by so doing, your feet will never depart from the place of faith, of glory, and of a divine stamina in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, let me say this. As I was praying, the Lord just revealed to me, and I'm going to use, um, I'm going to use Ryan as a point of contact to anybody who may have experienced this. The Lord revealed to me that there are some of us the reason why we don't know how to rejoice at the promises of God is because in the past we were constantly getting shut down. You wanted to be hopeful, you got shut down. You wanted to be optimistic, you got shut down. You wanted to rejoice, but you got shut down. And so you have forgotten what it means to rejoice. And I pray for you today that the teacher himself, the Holy Spirit, will teach you once again how to be hopeful in God's promises and how to rejoice at his salvation so that the disappointments of the past will no longer continue to instruct and determine your anticipation of tomorrow. That you will be able to believe fully to the full extent, extent that is required what the word of God says in the mighty name of Jesus. Now let us take all of that and receive the Lord's body and drink of his blood in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. I like to teach, but I have another secret passion, which I don't even think many of you know. I like carrying out deliverances. Yeah, and so one of the things that I have figured out, let me tell you a backstory. When I was little, the way people carried out deliverances around me was very scary. People would be throwing up and screaming and shouting and vomiting and all kinds of nasty stuff. And for some reason in my heart, I believed that there had to be another way. And the Lord continued to school me and helped me by his grace to nurture that confidence that there is another way. And so I carry out deliverances today by teaching. And so when I was coming for this meeting, I knew that there would be deliverances in this place. And so the last half of my message or the third of my message or the quarter of it, if you would, because it's like in the last 15 minutes, a lot of what I've been doing is deliverance. You don't even have to notice that it's going on, but you just have to be confident that now the unbelief that came with you here is not going back home with you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I know that many of us that have not been able to bear fruits because there are devourers that have been devouring our fruits and our crops, which have now been cast out, you will begin to bear fruits. I want to encourage you one for, let me, let's do this. You see, <laughs> I want to say to you, came the day, the Lord says that which happened in the month of July that was as a result of the enemy trying to expose you has now been erased. So all of that will be gone. In fact, it will be as though it never happened. You understand what I mean? It was just this month of July. It would be as though it never happened. And if the Lord delays his coming, you will see the standard of the Lord in the coming July. In the same area of your life. Now you will see the complete opposite of what the enemy did. The Lord is going to bring it. Yes. The faithfulness of God. I've been trying to curtail my excitement because of the things that I am seeing concerning Communion House. The last couple of days have been like wonderful. 
And let me tell you something, when the seer says the last couple of days have been wonderful, it's because the next couple of days will be even more wonderful. Because these things are the things that are about to happen, they have only just been revealed. So don't you worry, whatever the enemy thinks he has done. <laughs> you wait until you see what the Lord has done. You know, the enemy is like that fraudulent businessman that releases a fake product to take your money before the real one comes. I like to give this example. It makes some people sad, but I'll give it anyway because your emotions now should be that of joy, not sorrow. You know that whenever there's a new technology, Apple takes its time to package the technology and prepare it to have the best user experience. But Samsung will rush the same technology to market to take people's money and lock them into a contract so that when the real phone comes out, they've already spent their money. So that's what the devil does. The devil knows that God has already prepared something for you. He doesn't know what it is, but he comes with his own fake product to take your attention, to take your confidence before that which God is doing comes. Look at the disciples. God was preparing a glorious resurrection of the Son of Man and the devil quickly sold them on the idea of crucifixion that I say is dead and gone and they became sorrowful so that which has made you sad is the doing of Satan to occupy you and to rob you of the opportunity of receiving that which will make you joyful you will not lose anything by letting go of what the devil brought oh yes we're going into another round of deliverance the Lord is delivering you from the fear of change. Many of us have become accustomed to living our lives the way we live it, fearful, sorrowful, timid, not aspiring too much. In fact, you tell yourself not to believe that this will happen so that you're not going to be disappointed. And the Lord is saying, he is letting your heart receive the strength to let go of that posture. Let me say that again. You see, your heart has been holding on to things because of the fear of disappointments. And God is saying, I am empowering you in this moment to let go of those things. Change is needed. Change is here. Change is yours. So begin to believe again. There's nothing too good to be true. There's nothing too great for God to do for you. There's nothing too amazing to be part of your own life. You see, if it has ever been part of anybody's life in scripture or around you, you can have the same. So stop being afraid. Stop being afraid that if you believe, you'll be disappointed. No, the Bible says we have a hope that makes not ashamed in the mighty name of Jesus. So very quickly, let us now do that Thing that I spoke about the Yarim and the Thummim. So, if you would rise to your feet, but before you rise, make sure that you have already called to mind those two things that you need to hear God concerning. Alrighty. And if you want me to pray with you on those two things, I want you to come forward. Once you know what those two things are, come forward like this. Open your hands like that. One thing on the one hand and the other thing on the other hand. And as you come forward, I'm going to place my hands on you. I'm not going to tell you how, but I'm going to just place my hand on you. And you will pick your stone. The Yorim and the Thummim are here. That decision, let me tell you something, it will boost your own faith. That now you can hear God concerning things that have confused you. Things that have left you perturbed. Things that have left you perplexed. Trying to decide between this and that. The Lord is here. The Yorim and the Thummim are here. You will hear what God is saying. The Bible says whether you turn to the left or to the right, you will hear a voice telling you this is the way. I know. You sought the seer, but the Lord is teaching you how to see. 
in the mighty name of Jesus. So as soon as you're ready, come close to where I can touch you. In the mighty name of Jesus. So Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, this is the way. Walk in it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, thank you. This is the way. Walk in it. In the mighty name of Jesus. The Urim and the Thummim is here. This is the way. Walk in it. In the mighty name of Jesus. And this is the way. Walk in it. In the mighty name of Jesus. As I am telling you, this is the way. Walk in it. Your heart is receiving expressly from the Lord that which you must do. Of the two things that you are trying to decide concerning, this is the way. Walk in it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Now, concerning you, I saw something very different. You see, it is not just two things. In your own case, you actually need to know what to seek, what to pursue. So I will lay my hand upon your head for a supernatural delivery of the counsel of the Lord. Such that these two things will not even matter at the end of the day. Because when you know that which the Lord is asking of you, it is exactly what the Lord would have you proceed into. Now receive that in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Cody, this is the way. Walk in it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Which one is your right hand? Is it this one? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because this hand has picked the stone of decision. Your heart has decided. Now I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, that whatever bird has been sent from hell to whisper lies to your mind will not find you. When they, If they find you, they will not be able to speak to you. You will not doubt that which the Lord has said. It is the most unlikely of the two options. But the Lord is saying, that is by my design, so that you may know that it is not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, says God. And the Lord has seen your tears in the night. The Lord says, I saw you sitting up with a heavy heart, sitting up. He says, your eyes have been teary because your heart has been bleeding. He says, I am the healer. I am the Lord that heals you. When you came in here today, the Lord saw you. And the Lord's been waiting. And as you have come in here today, healing is yours in the mighty name of Jesus. Let your heart be mended before the Lord. Your heart is been mended by the Lord. Every pain that has plagued you in recent times will dissolve and be blown away. You have been comforted by the Holy Spirit in this season. In the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord says, remind her that this is the way. Walk in it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is good. Father, we give you praise. Let's just keep coming forth. You may open your eyes so as soon as the one person is gone, you can come. I want you to put both of your hands together and do like this. You raise it up and you slam it down like you're hitting a table with it. Yes. You see, what you're trying to decide between are two things that have come together to bring justice to victory. And what you have done is by bringing them together, you are saying, Lord, let your mercy be the judge. You will follow the leading of the mercy of God because God will open the door that no man can shut and he will tell you that is the way. It is not because of you and what you have done. It is because of my son and my mercy. You, yeah, it's going to be one of those things you'll be like, wow, really? I didn't even know that was an option. Yes, it is by God and by his mercy. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. God is good. Alrighty, Anita, um, you stop begging. Stop thanking. Okay? You've been You've been saying the prayer of, of what, what is not even supplication, so to speak. You've come to the Lord with a plea again and again. The same thing. The Lord keeps showing me. You've been coming. The same thing. And you've been begging God, God, please do this. God, please do that. God says, just thank me for it. You see, so you're transitioning into a prayer of thanksgiving because you have fulfilled the plea part of things. And this is your moment of supplication coupled with intercession because I have prayed for you. So now I want you to go home and be thanking God and say to God, Father, we thank you because though my eyes have not seen it, yet my eyes will see it. Your eyes will see it. Oh yeah, there's a great transformation that is coming. Your eyes will see it. 
your mouth will sing of his praises. Begin to thank him now. You see, because there is nothing that has been decided in the heart of a man that God cannot undo. Oh yes, yeah, so watch the Lord defeat the counsel of man. The counsel of man is being defeated by the mercy of God. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh, see, you don't worry. It is with the same mouth that they have boasted that they would come and submit to you before the Lord and say, wow, this is exactly what the Lord would have us do. It will sound like what you have never, it will sound like what you thought you could never hear, but you will hear it yeah, in this season, says the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There was somebody whose birthday it was very recently. Maybe one of those people we celebrated on Tuesday. Where's is, is Josephine's birthday was not that long ago? And Shayla, but Shayla is not here. Josephine, come. When is your birthday? June what? June 21st. Oh, that's not you. It must be you. Because I hear, I hear, but I knew it was in this direction. Somebody whose birthday was very recent. And the Lord says, he has something for you for your birthday. You see, the Lord is never late. But sometimes we pick up mail and we don't open it. Okay, now let me say this very quickly. Uh, did you write down the words that were prophesied over you at the women's conference? There was a particular word that was spoken to you. Isaiah 61. You already received the packaging of your present, but you haven't opened it. So go before the Lord and unpack it. And say, so Lord, everything that is in this promise is for me at this new age with which I will give glory to you. Now let it be unfolded unto me. Find them with the mighty name of Jesus. Because what I saw was, I saw you in that house and I saw that that was where you were when it was delivered to you. Find them with the mighty name of Jesus. In the The Lord has assigned to you two of his angels in this season to help you with the assignment that God has given to you. You understand what I mean? They will carry you. They will carry you. They will talk to you. They will give you counsel. They will help you write things down. You will write more beautifully than you normally write. It's not you. It is the angel of the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus. And let me tell you one more thing that they will do. They will announce you. So that your blessings can find you in this season. You see that which is missing from your life is looking for you. You think you're looking for it? No, it is actually looking for you and it will find you because I see one of those angels holding up a yellow flag right above where you are situated. And this is the season wherein you will be found in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, somebody is here. You lost a friend recently. Somebody who used to be your friend. Things happen and you're like, yeah, we can't be friends anymore. If you just lost a friend that really touched your heart recently, I have a message for you. Who are you? If you're right here and you know that somebody walked away from your life and you had to walk away from theirs, I want you to come and I will pray for you. And I'll tell you exactly what it is. Okay, the Lord says that relationship is a broken egg. If it's not broken, it cannot fail you. What the Lord wants to do is the Lord wants to bless you with great wisdom from what has happened to that relationship. You don't have to force it. You don't have to do anything other than have faith to anticipate the good that God wants to bring out of it. You see, there is an appreciation that was denied, a honor that was withheld. Don't worry. The Lord will restore that honor. The Lord will restore the appreciation. That which was not appreciated, that which you were not appreciated for, the Lord will restore gloriously. You leave it to him. But for you, just know that the Lord has wisdom for you through that which has happened. Again, it is a broken egg. It has to be broken for you to be filled and for you to be nurtured by it. So don't sorrow that it is broken. Rejoice that it is broken. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So you came out here also asking which way it is. This is the way. 
walk in it in the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord is speaking the hearts in here today. So that's it. The Lord already has told you which of the two it is. No, it's over. You see? And it's not even the man, but it was the Lord who said it to you in your heart. So now it's no longer a tussle. Now you already know what to do. God bless you. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you. Pops, this is the way. Walk in it. This is the way. Walk in it. In the mighty name of Jesus. And because the Lord is saying that this is not about the decision. This is about an anticipation. What your heart is really doing is not trying to decide between this or that. What your heart is doing is your heart is really longing to see the end of God. And so I tell you what, the reason why this is the way and this is the way is because God is saying to you that he has done it. He's letting you know that it's beyond trying to decide. You see, your heart has an anticipation. And that anticipation is going to be fulfilled in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, I'm going to give you a very, very specific word. Okay? A very specific word. You see, there is an item in your kitchen that you haven't seen in a while. It's there. It's not like it's completely hidden, but to you, it's been hidden for a while. In the coming days, you will find it. Don't go looking for it. If by the time you get home, other things will occupy your mind. But when you find it, let me tell you what it's going to do. It's going to bring a smile to your face because it will remind you of something the Lord has done for you that you have yet to receive, that you have yet to enjoy, that has yet to enrich your life. But it's just, it's just an awareness. It will just come to you. You see, like I told you, it's a very specific word because when that happens, ah, oh my goodness, seven seasons will pass in an instant. And what it means for seven seasons to pass in an instant is because you will reap sevenfold that which you have sown. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for my brother Greg. Thank you for my brother Greg. The Lord is strengthening your leg. I see that there's a muscle that has been strained in the back of your leg. And the Lord is saying, I am taking care of it. I'm going to strengthen you. You will stand firm. You see, many of us are accustomed to the Lord healing us. But many of us don't even know that there are times where the Lord allows certain things to pass over us. This is a Passover kind of blessing. And so give him thanks for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Alrighty, anybody else? Oh, you already know. You see, I was praying for somebody and I saw that the Lord was speaking to your heart. So the decision is already made. You understand what I mean? In fact, now you're wondering why that was even a, a reason to choose between this and that. It's obviously this. Yes, because the Spirit of the Lord bears witness with your spirit that you are led by Him. It is obviously that, not because of your emotions, not because of your sentiment, but because your spirit now knows very clearly what you must do. And you will see the result of your obedience and your perseverance. There is still a little stretch of the road in this decision that you have made that will require perseverance. The, the Lord is showing to me a couple of days wherein you'd have to wait to even know whether it is working or not. But don't worry, that patience is also given together with it. And you will be patient to wait for it. Uh, no worry, see, somebody will come and say, oh, I don't think this is working. Immediately shut them down and say, it is. You just haven't seen it. Yes, don't let them keep you distracted from you see oh let me tell you something they will bring you counsel and say you know we told you that we shouldn't do this don't worry you just tell them to wait tell them in a few days you will see you will be right and they will be wrong and it's okay for that to happen simply because you would have been equally wrong if you have not heard God but now that you have heard God be confident you see don't let anything make you change your mind don't let them make you feel defeated. Like, oh, maybe you didn't hear God. That would be the devil. The devil wants you to doubt. But it's okay. Because you will not doubt. Because the word of the Lord has come to strengthen you and to embolden you. So that this testimony will be the reason why some of them will start paying attention to what God is saying. In the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you come? Oh, yeah. Because I was like, why is Allah not coming? You see, so you came. Praise the Lord. I'm going to tell you something else about it later on. 
Ah, 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 ah. Okay, now I know what it is. <laughs> you see, you came for two things. One in this hand and one in the other hand. And the Lord is saying the two things that you should bring, he actually left them back there. So go back there and come back again with a fresh thought. You see, because what you are trying to decide and hear God clearly concerning is not, see, these ones are important, the first one, but those ones are more important. So just go back there, kneel if you need to, but let your heart receive a bringing forth from the deep, that which is of utmost important for this season. And then you will receive an answer of that as you come up here in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Oh, come on. You know when I was talking about the person whose career seems not to ever going to happen? I saw you, you were pulling on that word. Okay? The Lord has a deposit for you. You have received what you should receive out of that word. But there is more. Okay? Now let me tell you this. There was a story that was told about you when you were young. You seem to be about the age of six or seven. A story was told about you. And there were forces that picked up on that story and said it was not going to happen. Well, now they have lost the battle because that story is about to become the reality of your existence. A blessed life. You see, the enemy has been fighting you so that you don't lift up the ones who cannot get up on their own. There are people in the, your life that have to be picked up and put in the water because they cannot do it on their own. And that is the reason why the enemy has been opposing you. It is not just for you, it is for the sake of those that God has empowered you to lift up, the ones that God has called you to lift up. You see, sometimes when you think about them, you think about them and you're like, how is this person going to make it? They will make it by your obedience, by what God is doing in your life. So don't worry about them too much. Anticipate what God wants to do with you. God knows your heart. He knows you want to help. You are calling to mind as I'm speaking right now, the ones that you would love to help, the situations that you would love to change. If only the Lord would answer me and put me in this situation, I will make a difference in this life and in that life. The Lord says, yes, you will, because I am the glory and the lifter of your head. The Lord is lifting you up so that you can lift them up. He will honor you. You see, God has seen your heart. Even though the Lord would have me say this to you, that there have been seasons where you think that, well, to each his own. The reason why you were saying to each his own was because your heart was trying to chicken away from the responsibility and just say, you know what, I'm going to just take care of myself. They can take care of themselves. The Lord is saying, no, that is not your real, real intention. Your real intention is to be a blessing. And the reason why you were accepting to just look after yourself is because you have felt that powerlessness. But the Lord is saying that he is the wind to your sail. Keep hope alive. Keep loving. Keep loving and keep believing in those people. See, because the Lord is going to lift you and empower you to help them in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. God is good. Anybody else? Oh, you, you know, this is interesting. I see you teaching a class. You're standing there, you're teaching the class. Not very many people, just a couple of people. You're teaching them and you're telling them that that's how you do it. But for a moment, you thought to yourself, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be nice if I can just point outside and say, look, I did it and look at the result. You want to have something to show. But the Lord is saying, you don't worry, just teach. And while you are yet speaking, your miracle will form on the outside. And by faith, you will say, look, I did it. Look at the result. Because let me tell you something, it is by your testimony that they will receive faith. When they see that which you are teaching them of the word of God. Let me tell you something. I want to encourage you. Go and study Matthew chapter 12. A lot of what you've been trying to tell people is there in the teachings of Jesus. Go into Matthew chapter 12 and it's going to become apparent to you that, well, if I just use this parable and use this example, maybe they will hear me and receive instruction and I will have the testimony to show for it. You see, because some people don't want to listen because they're like, why are you telling me that? I see you. Even you don't have this. Even you haven't done that. Don't worry about it. Just be bold. Let your confidence be in God, not in achievement. And then you will achieve in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Zoe, you see, I know that you have a decision in your heart that has to do with your children. And I pray for you in the mighty name of Jesus that you will not make a move on your own. 
you will see what the Lord is doing in their lives, particularly your boy. And then you will do that which your heavenly father does. Jesus says that which I see my father do, the same do I. You see, the Lord is offering you help. What you have not been able to achieve in a face-to-face -face conversation, the Lord will achieve in a dream. And so you don't worry. He's gone ahead of you. He's breaking up your fallow grounds. So that when you come in with your motherly counsel, the counsel of the Lord would have already paved the way for you. And so, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I speak forth. I have spoken this promise over your daughter. And so, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, because the dream has already been spoken forth, once you know this change, ask and say, tell me what's really happening. There might be reluctance, but eventually you will know that the Lord has done the work. God is giving you conquest. He's giving you victory. And so, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. This is the way. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is good. Alrighty, Alan, come. Come, 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 come. Hey, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, how about if you could have the outcome of both options? You see, what God wants to do is to give you the outcome. So whether you go here or go there, you will have the blessing of either way that you take. And the Lord is saying, this is the way. Walk in it. In the mighty name of Jesus. It is going to be in another dream. And that's where it's going to be made clear. This time around, you will see one that you have seen before. That's going to be the sign to you of which dream it is. In this dream, you will see one that you have seen before. Friend or foe, you will see one that you have seen before. In the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. God is good. Alrighty. So that's it, folks. That's all that we have time to take today. But I want to encourage you, folks. That one, uh, that other one thing. In fact, the Lord says, let us still do it here. You know, I told you that we're doing two things. So right now, just very quickly. I pray for you. That every emotion that is within you will respond to the promise of God. So that business that child, that house, that memory, that relationship that has brought negative emotions of sorrow to your heart. This time around, as they come to mind, they will bring peace. As they come to mind, they will bring joy because the sail of your heart is now moving by the wind of faith. The sail of your heart is moving by the word of God. The sail of your heart is being determined by the promises that are in the word of God. So no longer do your, does your heart have to skip a bit, a beat, the next time you remember them. The next time you think about it, you're not going to be fearful, nor anxious, but you're going to be joyful and confident in God. The hand of the Lord has done this great thing today so that you can be encouraged to pray more and to seek him more. Because what he's seeking in these days is your attention. He's asking for you to come and sit with him and watch with him a little. So the Lord is taking care of these things right this very moment so that you can be encouraged in your heart to seek after him in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So very quickly, guys, this week, beginning tomorrow, some of you might even want to start tonight. One hour. One hour is not a long time. Your average Netflix show is about an hour. And you watch five of them back to back. So why don't we put the devil to shame? Put the flesh to shame. By watching an hour. You can pray for... Has anyone ever... If you are here and you've never prayed for an hour, don't be ashamed. Can I see your hand? You've never prayed for an hour. Well, this time around, I want you to pray consistently for an hour. Oh yeah. Okay, so this week, you will pray every day for an hour. Not intentionally. Maybe if I was like hurt or afflicted or something. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah right. Exactly. But this time around, it's going to be very intentional. You sit down there. You take your Bible with you. Read the promises of the Word of God. You see, let me tell you one of the things that I'm going to be praying about. Let me borrow you one or lend you one, okay? Matthew 24, verse 7. This is one of the things that I'm going to be praying about. If you understand the revelation and the scripture... You would even pray this many days and not be tired and not be bored. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 24 verse 7. 
And then we're finally going to leave this place. My daughter made me promise that we're not going to be late today. So I may have to buy her donuts on the way because this is not as early as I said. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24 verse 7, that nation, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. This is one of the things that I'm going to be praying this week. And my posture in prayer will be the prayer of thanksgiving. You know why? The Lord took me to the scripture and he said to me, he said, I'm about to bless you. Because the true treasure and true wealth in this existence only happens when you are victorious in battle. Look at the people that have been wealthy families, the people who have been wealthy families for centuries and for generations. They are people who went to war and won. So when the Lord is saying nations will rise against nations, the Lord is saying I'm doing a wealth redistribution. So when a nation rises against you, it's your opportunity to take all of what they have. He says there will be earthquakes in a number of places. The Lord is saying yes, because there are certain strongholds that have been built to keep you out that my earthquakes will break into pieces. This is a big blessing. But like the disciples, if you are not in tune with heaven, your heart will be sorrowful. Oh, that there's going to be wars. There's going to be earthquakes and famines and pestilences. Have you forgotten that you are like Joseph in the land? Joseph would not have had relevance if not for the famine that came to Egypt. David was the greatest king because he was the most skillful fighter. It was because God raised him at the time of war. And now everybody recognizes his great victories. But he didn't just have the victories because he went to write an exam. He fought wars. Nations rode against him. By the end of his 40-year reign, the nation of Israel was the wealthiest it had ever been simply because nations rose against him. So this is what I am praying a lot this week. And I am praying it as a prayer of thanksgiving. I'll be singing back and forth, dancing before the Lord simply because my victory is coming. Because there's a transfer of wealth. So as many oppositions as I have faced in the past, now they're turning around for my good. So I want to encourage you, you can start with that one. And just begin to thank God for all the people that have let you down, all the situations that have frustrated you, simply because those things have come to be a blessing to you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Alrighty, so the last thing we're gonna to do today, sit down, praise God. Alan is gonna to come to receive the offering and to take us through the announcements that we have on the screen. But this one thing that I have for you, we spent about 20 minutes at least in this meeting today just having deliverances. The scriptures that the Lord was taking us to, the pronouncements that I was making, they were coming with authority to deliver you and to set you free. But now that your heart is liberated, you can't afford to leave it empty. Okay? So tell yourself as you're walking out through this door, I will study the word. I will fill myself with scriptures. I will fill myself with love for God. I will fill myself with passion for the things of God. Simply because when the Lord is telling you that wickedness is being removed from your heart, it is now your place to fill your heart with goodness. The Bible says, do not, be over, do not repay evil with evil, but have a regard for good. So begin to have a regard for good. Begin to meditate on joyful things, on things that have a good report. Simply because if you don't fill yourself with the right stuff, Satan has not resigned. He's still active. It will come and fill your heart with negative stuff. Okay? So that's one thing that you need to do. Make, like she said, be intentional about filling yourself up with the promises of God. Alrighty. Now, one more thing that I'm going to give to you. I was going to escape without giving this to you, but the Lord brought it to my attention again. Now, I want you to do this. As many of you as can pray, standing by a window in your house and speaking to the wind, I want you to speak the scripture to the wind of your house. Psalms 147. We're going to read verse 1 and 3. Maybe we won't just read 3. Um, where is it? Psalms 147. Verse 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wound. He heals the brokenhearted 
and binds up their wound. Why do you need to stand by the window to announce this promise? Folks, it's Saturday night. Most of you are not going anywhere tomorrow, so let me take more of your time. You will thank me later. The Lord said to me, announce it to the wind. Why are you announcing to the wind that the Lord heals the brokenhearted? The Lord says there are certain blessings that haven't come into your life because your arms have been too weak to uphold them, to receive them. So now that the Lord is saying that he's healing you and restoring you, announce to the wind to go and bring all of those blessings now because you are ready. Some of you, God wants to give you friends and spouses, but while you were still broken, you would have frustrated them if they came into your life. And the Lord is saying, now that I have healed you, tell the wind to go and announce to them where to find you. Many of you, you have, many of us have been lazy, have been unskillful in the things that God has called us to do. And that is the reason why the opportunities have not come. The Lord has healed you now. Announce to the wind, the Lord has healed me. Bring my blessing. Can we read that Psalms again? Psalms 147. If I were you, I will go home and stand by my window and declare that now that the Lord has healed me and has bound my wound, I am ready for my blessing. The Lord will not give you more than you can handle. So now that you are able to handle more, what are you waiting for? Speak to your blessing, speak to the wind. God bless you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What a night tonight. I know I'm filled up. Praise the Lord. We have the giving details on screen. We know what time it is. We thank God for what he's done. He's spoken to us this time of renewal. I'm so thankful for the voice of God. And so as a sign of thanksgiving and praise let's give to the Lord in our tithing offering let's make an offering unto him for what he's done many of the words that have come forth is praising in advance thanking the Lord for what he's already done and so let's move in that in our giving if you need an envelope they're right here of course we have pens prepared for you to fill that out fill that check out on the screen you'll see our giving details to give online we'll wait a couple of minutes so that we can prepare those things and we will pray. Father, we give you praise. Lord, we say unto you that it's by your hand and by your hand alone that you have done these things, O oh God, that you have met with us. Father, for indeed you give seed to the sower. Father, we give thanks unto you tonight. We worship you because you have given to us, O oh God, way more than we could have ever imagined, O oh God. And we're thankful. Now, Lord, even by your prophet, as you have healed us tonight, help us to receive even the more that you have for us, O oh God. And Lord, we'll say we give it back unto you, Lord. We give it back unto you. Lord, we thank you as you prepare our hearts to Increase even in our giving, oh God, even for those of us that have desired to know, Lord, what should my giving be this season? What is pleasing in your sight this season? Lord, we thank you that you speak to us in this manner. Father, we lift up every offering before you, and Lord, we ask that you help it to be sweet smelling, pleasing in your sight. Lord, we ask of thee that you bless it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Not, all right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So uh, my fellas in the house, we have Men's Monday coming up this Monday. Isaac, please get with me, man. We got you in the group chat. We're going to get you taken care of. Men's Monday at Hammerheads, 7 p.m. We're going to chop it up, have a good time, play some pool. Um, and of course, we'll be back Tuesday for family dinner and teaching Tuesday. And we'll go from there. Any other updates, we'll make sure to send out. Uh, if you have not yet given us your details where we can send you emails and texts, please fill out a connect card. We want to make sure we got you locked in there so that you know what the Lord is doing in this house. Glory to God. Father, we thank you yet again for what you're doing in this house at this hour. We thank you for every household that's represented here, oh God. For Lord, how you have dealt with us beautifully tonight, oh God. Now, Lord, 
Help us to run with the word that you've given us. Help us to stand on it, oh God. Holy Spirit, we ask of thee, keep us. Keep us this season. Lord, all glory and honor belong to you. All in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Amen. All right, y'all have a blessed week.